You're listening to the Legal Talk Network. Hello, I'm Monica Bay. And I'm Bob Ambrogi. We've been writing about law and technology for more than 30 years. That's right. During that time, we've witnessed many changes and innovations. Technology is improving the practice of law, helping lawyers deliver their services faster and cheaper. Which benefits not only lawyers and their clients, but everyone. And moves us closer to the goal of access to justice for all. Tune in every month as we explore new legal technology and the people behind the tech. Here on Law Technology Now. Hello, this is Dan Lina. Welcome to Law Technology Now on the Legal Talk Network. I'm honored to join Monica Bay as a host of Law Technology Now, and I'm thrilled that my first guest is Connie Brenton. Connie is the Chief of Staff and Senior Director of Legal Operations at NetApp. She's also the CEO of the Corporate Legal Operations Consortium. Connie, welcome to the show. Thank you. I am delighted to be here. Well, before we get started, we'd like to thank our sponsor. Support for this podcast and the following message comes from Thomson Reuters Westlaw Edge. Thank you, Thomson Reuters. All right, Connie, let's jump right in. So you're the Chief of Staff and Senior Director of Legal Operations at NetApp. Can you tell us just a bit more about what you do, particularly with respect to Senior Director of Legal Operations? Legal Operations is a relatively new role in the legal industry, and it it involves running your legal department like a business. It has come about because of the, the evolving role of the general counsel. The general counsel is expected now to be a counselor to the CEO, and the in-house legal departments are becoming big businesses. Many of the legal departments are in the range of three to 500 attorneys, so the size of a mid- or large-sized law firm. The skill set is also different in running a legal department like a business, And it's important to keep experts in that area to free up the general counsel to handle the service that is required as he supports the CEO and his team. Okay. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. And Connie, I know you are one of the hardest working people I know, but I also see that, you know, I've seen you working with uh, Matt Fawcett and some of your team at NetApp and the stuff you do at Clock. And, and it seems like you really have a lot of fun in building this community of, of legal operations professionals. Can you tell us just kind of a little bit about that? Well, we're in a time of innovation like we have just not seen before. The role is new, the community is new, the pace of change is faster than we have seen in decades. And as a result of that, we're creating. So we're creating in real time. And for those of us who have a high risk tolerance and don't mind making mistakes failing fast, this is probably the most exciting job I've ever had. I'm good usually for two years in any particular role, and I have been at NetApp uh, working for Matt Fawcett for eight years. We have created what we call the 12 core competencies. So one of the first things we have been asked about and you asked about today is what in the world is legal operations? And as a community, we started out by defining the role itself because it's so new. You can see it in living color on the clock.org website, but we refer to it as the 12 core competencies wheel And the role is divided into a number of different specialties. And because the role has so many facets to it, it is also a difficult role. And it's a difficult role to be trained in because the law schools and legal departments have not had formal training programs to bring people up to speed in this particular role of legal ops. Yeah, that, well, that makes a lot of sense. You know, you, you mentioned something there about failing fast. And I think there's a lot of confusion about what that means. I, I try to reframe that sometimes, L- lawyers especially, when you say fail fast, right, it sometimes doesn't translate very well. I, I try to sometimes frame it as, as learn fast. But however you would w- like to define it, can you kind of just tell us a little bit more? What does that mean about this 
kind of creating a culture of failing fast? What's the benefit derived from that? The legal personality is conservative. We know that. There have been a number of studies defining the legal personality type. We are hired and trained to identify risk, and we do not like making mistakes. However, when you are inputting technology and you are changing the way that you practice, you will make a mistake. 100% of the time when you're rolling out a new technology, you will make a mistake. And it took me several years to realize that I need to give the attorneys on my team permission and acknowledge the fact that they should be looking for the mistake that we will make. Because here's the flip side of the coin. When you make a mistake, you have an unintended consequence. And oftentimes, the unintended consequence gets you to a way better place than you had intended on going. So you plan on going from A to B, you end up going from A to Z with a much better result than you intended. And it's because of that failure. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, and that, that's really how we learn in organizations. And sometimes this fear of failure means not really examining how we're doing things. So that's really great example. The other thing that I would say that oftentimes when you are failing, particularly when you're putting a legal operations function in place, is you will have financial costs. And sometimes you will end up having spent money on a particular implementation or a particular tool that at the end of the day, you realize it's not going to work and you need to have the courage to throw it away and start over. Yeah, that's another great example. Well, and you know, a lot of this creating this culture is happening in the Corporate Legal Operations Consortium, CLOCK, and, and you're the CEO of CLOCK. Can you just tell us a little bit about how it was founded and, and how it's grown? CLOCK stands for Corporate Legal Operations Consortium, CLOC, no K on that. And it started out of a necessity. So I had moved from Colorado to California working for Oracle, and the general counsel wanted benchmarking information. This was a new community for me. And so I got on the phone and started calling the few people that I knew were in the role. And we got together, and over in the next I don't know, seven or eight years, we met every other month in person, primarily in the Bay Area, exchanging best practices. At the beginning of 2016, we decided that we would incorporate into a nonprofit, that the the role was being defined by others outside of legal ops, which doesn't make a lot of sense. So the people who are actually practicing the role were not defining the role. And that was one of the primary instigators for creating this consortium, in addition to the four pillars, which I'll get to momentarily. And we started the organization with a, we refer to it as a book club of about 40. Some members refer to it as therapy because it's a very difficult (laughs) role, very difficult role. And it grew from an informal group of about 42. Now we have in little less than three years, 1,800 members, 900 companies. Uh, We're global. We represent 44 states in the U.S. and 43 countries globally. We also have three institutes, and we purposely called them institutes because this is a place where you can come and actually get trained in legal operations. The first institute we held was in San Francisco. We held it with 12 weeks of planning, and we held it close to home in case we needed a stapler, and we had 500 attendees. The following year, we outgrew San Francisco. We moved to Las Vegas, and we had 1,000 attendees. This last year was our third, and we had 2,000 attendees. So you can see the exponential growth. We have also held an institute in London last year, and we will continue to hold an institute in London in January of each year. And we had our first institute in Australia just in April. So we are on uh, multiple continents now servicing the, the globe. 
So Connie, I think a lot of people think that clock and operations is just about big companies and big law firms. Can you tell us a little bit about the members, some of which are, are smaller corporate legal departments? I mean, what percentage of your members would you say fall into that bucket? It's a really good question. This is one of the reasons that it's so indicative of what is happening in the industry. When we first started the book club o'clock, we had a requirement that you have 50 people in your department or more. Uh, we felt like the issues that we were facing as a medium to large in-house department were different than those in the smaller departments. I don't think that is true anymore. The role is also being added sometimes as the number two lawyer in the department. So it is being added much more frequently, sooner, and there is much more that we have in common. Of the 900 companies that are members, 60% of the Fortune 500 are represented as clock members and about a third of the Fortune 500, which means we have about 50% large, uh, 50% small to medium size. We also have regional groups because we have found that meeting in person, that that face-to-face interaction is critically important as we grow in in our careers and as we grow as as a community. And one of our largest groups is ELD, Emerging Legal Department. And so those are legal departments who are either big or small in size but relatively new in their development of the legal operations team. Yeah, it's really interesting to obs- observe this growth and just see how it is. I mean, I've, I've met some solo GCs who are part of CLOCK and, and the ability for them to tap into the CLOCK community and learn best practices for how to run their legal department, how to manage outside law firms is, is, is a real advantage for them in setting up these legal departments. You bring up the most critical point. This community is founded on collaboration. It is an expectation that you collaborate if you're part of this community. And it has created this, almost this religious movement type of feeling. So when you meet somebody in the role, there is a click because the role is so complex and so new and difficult, when we connect with one another, there is a sense of wanting to help newbies and also growing the entire community in terms of best practices. Yeah. I mean, we're seeing these same disciplines applied in legal aid organizations and courts. Uh, We're also seeing now law firms. Law firms have been doing things in this space for a little while, but we're seeing more and more of a trend towards calling it legal operations inside of law firms as well. I mean, do you think we'll get to the point where we refer to all this as legal operations, kind of like where you went before from, oh, big departments are different than small departments? Well, we'll just kind of realize it's operations, no matter what kind of organization you're doing it in. Yeah, that's a good question. I should go back to the four pillars of CLOCK. So the four pillars are educate. I've talked about that a little bit. There's no place to get trained right now. The law schools are not training. The business schools have not picked it up. It's a place to network. And here's a differentiator. CLOCK embraces the legal ecosystem. We have found that if we don't have everybody in the legal ecosystem in the room together, we don't create a solution that works. And your question goes directly to that fact that we have embraced the legal ecosystem. So it will certainly, we will certainly start to adopt the same language as we start to have the same conversations behind the firewall at an in-house department and a law firm. And then finally, the fourth pillar is driving industry change. Yeah, that's great. And, and I've, I really appreciate Clock's leadership in bringing this ecosystem together. I've been a ch- had a chance to attend the last couple of institutes and, and I, I look forward to, to staying involved and really appreciate the work you're doing. You know, you mentioned the book club. What books would you suggest, do you think? Or does Clock have a list of recommended books? Where, where should someone start if they're interested in, in building this kind of a culture and, and uh, building the legal operations function with inside of their organization? Well, that's a very good idea to start a reading list of (laughs) 
for his former book club, but we do not have one as of yet. We'll add it to our list of resources. Where I would start, however, is I would start on the clock website. And so we have lots of best practices shared there. Because we embrace the legal ecosystem, we have an ability to create what we're calling clock initiatives. They are industry standards or best practices wherein we have members of multiple areas of the legal industry gathering together. One of the ones that you and I are actually working on right now is the CIO Cybersecurity Clock Initiative. And that group of individuals consists of CIOs from law firms, law schools, in-house people, service providers, technology providers, and some regulators. It's a good example of the industry coming together to create a win-win-win solution for all of us in the ecosystem, whether it be a small department or a big department, and whether it be uh, local or global. I just got back from Europe, and they have a similar CIO group already meeting, and we have now talked about joining and collaborating across the continents. Yeah, that's that's so helpful. These initiatives are great, bringing all these stakeholders together, especially when you start talking about international stakeholders and and more and more of everything we do requires considering an international perspective. So getting all those folks to the table is great. Let's shift gears just a little bit to innovation, right? And and innovation is a really big topic these days. We tend to maybe get focused on artificial intelligence, but it's also talk about process improvement, project management, being data-driven, things like that. What do you really expect from your law firms when it comes to innovation? When we're talking innovation, we're really looking for a mindset shift. So it doesn't come down to a particular single behavior. Are you using this technology? Are you using electronic signature? We're really looking for a change in how you're thinking about delivering legal services because it it plays into all of the processes, all of the choices that you're making. It is also one of the identifiers when we're making choices of which law firms to hire and, and which ones to not. You can identify a innovator relatively easily. The language is different when you're talking to an innovator. I don't know if many of you have tried to get your parents leveraging a cool new app. But once you start having that conversation, immediately you realize you're talking past one another. Same thing happens when we're having conversations with law firms. And so it is is the foundation of innovation is changing the mindset because everything flows from that. And the other thing that we're in this really interesting time of this paradigm shift of of innovating and changing the way that we work together, because we're creating together, we can make mistakes along the way. And it opens the door to having more collaborative, more innovative, more big thinking options and combining resources where we have not in the past. The other thing I would suggest is that the people that the law firms are introducing to their in-house clients be expanded. Traditionally, it has been law firm partner to the in-house attorney. However, with the expansion of legal operations, our conversations, for example, with the CIOs or with the legal project managers or with the COOs is a very different yet very important conversation when we're creating a partnership that's sticky and valuable. Well, you mentioned some of these other professionals, project managers, technologists, data scientists, designers, getting involved in the delivery of legal services. So picture the partner at a large law firm who can tap into these resources. As the client, what's your expectation as far as the partner's understanding of these things? Is it enough just to be able to have those people on the team? It's an interesting question. Again, it's the mindset that we're looking for with the partner. So we really need to have an innovative mindset. 
I don't think it's imperative that the attorney partner understands the nuts and bolts of the data scientists. I do think it's critical that they know that they have those resources at their fingertips and that they can provide analytics and data to their in-house customers. What we have found is that many times large law firms will have a pool of very talented resources that the partners don't leverage. They don't bring them to the quarterly business reviews. They don't ask these resources for metrics. They rely on their in-house departments for metrics, which we are getting better and better at providing. But it would be a treat to have both parties or three parties if we have a a third, perhaps an LPO in the mix, to come to the table with each one of their separate metrics. Anytime we collaborate, anytime we start sharing our vision with different lenses, we come up with better solutions. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, the more we're talking about multidisciplinary teams being able to c- communicate within that team. So if you're the, the subject matter expert as a partner, being able to talk to the data scientists and, and then understanding the context and really good project managers and data scientists have some of that context, but you want the lawyer to, to be able to contribute and have the context of understanding project management and, and data science, for example. You know, in, in this same kind of discussion, I think sometimes the change management piece of this is difficult in, in the law firms as well. And, and I think sometimes folks in the law firms tend to see this as kind of a innovation as a race to the bottom. And, uh, you know, what do you, what would you say are some of the opportunities? What, what is the upside? Like why should people in law firms be getting excited about the opportunities to innovate and think about operations? Oh my goodness. All you need to do is start. If you start innovating, if you start playing with some of these technologies, it's self-reinforcing. It's so much fun. The process has changed. The way of thinking changes. Your community changes. What you can provide, the value you can provide to your customers, and the way you provide it changes, and it's tons of fun. The hard part is getting people to start. And it it goes back to, I think, one of your first questions. It's that fear of failing that keeps the attorney personality from just jumping into the pool. Yeah, well, that maybe highlights a question too. Like when frequently I think sometimes this is drilling even a little bit deeper in this idea of failing fast and we talk about mistakes. I think sometimes attorneys tend to equate mistakes with malpractice, right? And and I mean, uh, the prime of projects I'm familiar with, we're, I mean, we're not talking about that sort of failure, right? We're talking about much smaller sort of things where we try something new and it doesn't work. Does that kind of comport with what you're talking about? Yeah, I totally agree with you. Where you can start playing around with all of this new technology that's available is on the back office. So who cares, right? You can always end up going back and fixing it. And there's no mistake that is going to rise to the level of malpractice. You can start with process automation or digital transformation or AI on the back end. You can start playing with technologies. If you start playing with technologies now, you will be ahead of the game five years from now. You can't make up for the time that you're losing by not starting. Well, I think now's a good time to take a quick break before we continue our interview with Connie Brenton. And so we'll hear a brief message from our sponsor. Thomson Reuters Westlaw Edge is the most intelligent legal research platform ever. Powered by state-of-the-art artificial intelligence, Westlaw Edge delivers the fastest answers and the most valuable insights, providing you with a clear strategic advantage. The advanced features on Westlaw Edge allow legal professionals to practice with a greater degree of certainty and confidence never before available. Visit westlawedge.com to learn more. And we're back. Thank you for joining us. We're with Connie Brenton. Connie, there's a lot of talk about data-driven lawyering today. Can you tell us just a little bit about, from your perspective, what that means? My 
General Counsel just posted a blog post called Governance in the Age of AI and Data. As companies are running headlong into digital transformation, they're turning to AI and ML, machine learning, to reach new customers, to innovate differently, to create new business models. And we all we need to do is look at the numbers. And this is this is true not just with AI, but with with all of the innovation that we're seeing. There is an expected trillion dollar investment in digital transformation this year. It's going to be a priority of our global economy. We are watching it happen all around us. So even if it is slow to come to the legal industry, because we are traditionally slower at adopting cutting edge technologies, it will affect how we practice. And it's, again, very fun. There is AI technology out there now, and it's easy to toy with because oftentimes you can leverage AI with a cleanup project or some kind of back office project, and it doesn't have to be touching the customer yet. But it is right front and center in terms of where we're going as a global economy. And because we are in a transformational era, we'll be impacted by our ability to leverage AI. Let me also add the data is the heart of AI and machine learning. It is now recognized as they're calling it the new oil, as the most valuable resource companies have. Mike Dell said, AI is your rocket ship and data is the fuel for your rocket. So not only are we gathering data, but there's immense pressure to leverage this data and to become more efficient in how we deliver legal services. Yeah. So when we think about data, I think maybe from a delivering the legal services piece of it, maybe I would drop it in the three buckets. There's data that is used around pricing, identifying lawyers, things like that. And then there can be data around actual, the operations function, delivering the service. And then we're also seeing data now used to predict outcomes in transactions or in litigation. Uh, one of the best examples is predicting the likelihood of winning an important motion, for example, in a, in a litigation matter. Do those three buckets to, to you kind of make sense as far as how to think about where data is being used in legal services delivery? Yes, it is. Keep in mind that the NetApp legal department is the legal department of the future. We measure everything. As a result of that, We have been able to, and this is one of those unintended consequences. So a couple of years ago, we started benchmarking rates. And so now after two years of tracking trends, we can tell you how much something should cost. As a result of that, we've been able to move 86% of our billing to fixed fee. That wasn't our intent when we started out playing with this data but that's where we have ended up. Data is also captured and leveraged across the enterprise. We recently moved the platform that we held our legal dashboard on to the enterprise dashboard so that we could get support from our own internal IT department. And when we did that, we certified 160 different reports that we run monthly to keep the legal department the NetApp legal department running efficiently. Yeah, and and I know that a lot of uh, organizations now have been not just trying to figure out what rates their lawyers should be charging, but really trying to assess the quality of the services they're getting from their law firms. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing in that space? Yes, and that has been a common theme also amongst CLOCK members. The CLOCK community has a collaboration board, and you can put any question you want up on the board, and you can get an answer to that within 10 minutes. Quality is often one of those topics that gets raised repeatedly. We also have created some CLOCK initiatives around quality assessment. So you can get onto the CLOCK website, pick up the quality assessment 
questions and administer them internally. NetApp Legal Department, again, being the legal department of the future, are in the midst of doing a 360 quality assessment so that we will be evaluating our law firms and our law firms will be evaluating us. And I shouldn't confine it just to our law firms because we outsource 20% of our department to a law company, and they will be involved in this quality assessment as well. The 360 reviews is just great. I mean, I I really think any organization committed to continuous improvement ought to do something like that. But of course, the usual reaction you hear from people is like, heck no, we're not. It's it's, (laughs) it's uncomfortable to be in that position. But so that's really great to hear. Just like anything, somebody has to go first, right? Yeah. So people on both sides are not jumping up and down. Like the law firm doesn't want to rate the customer and we're not sure we would like to be rated. Yeah, well, I I think it it really fits well with this idea though of of collaborating and being in partnership and understanding that in your partnership, you want both organizations to succeed and how best to do that without giving real feedback to each other. So it's, it's, it's it's really great to hear that you're doing that. You know, I think that fits with, I've heard you and uh, NetApp GC, Matt Fawcett, talk a lot about collaborating with law firms on on innovation projects and just generally, right, viewing law firms and and other legal service delivery organizations as partners. Uh, What advice would you give for successful collaboration projects between uh, legal departments and law firms and and the other organizations that might be involved in those projects? At the heart of collaboration and innovation is trust. And so when you start to collaborate, it's very important that you keep that communication open and transparent and frequent. For example, we moved to fixed fee pricing on litigation recently. Neither one of us had done it. And as I said earlier, anytime you're going to do it for the first time, you will make mistakes. So we had a conversation around looking for unintended consequences. I prefer to use unintended consequences and mistakes. It just was, you expected this to happen and and that happened. And if you keep that communication open, the relationship grows, you end up learning far more about each other's businesses. You understand the constraints of both sides. The law firm understands the constraints that in-house departments function under and vice versa. We have an example of we engaged a law firm for a fixed fee on a litigation and it was a joint defense. And the question I always ask is, are you seeing a behavior change because of this new billing model? And Two examples of answers that we have gotten. One, there was a joint defense. And so what they were getting is feedback on drafts of documents back from the third-party law firm. They were getting two, three, four rounds of feedback. And the feedback, that meant notes, handwritten notes were being scribbled in the margins, which were then being transcribed by one of the admins. And as you can see, that is highly inefficient. And when you become that inefficient under a fixed fee model, you start biting into your profit margin and that drives efficiency. So that was one good example. The other example was, again, another litigation and different law firm. And they talked about being able to leverage more senior resources that they might not have leveraged if we were on hourly because they would have had to gotten the the hourly partner onboarded under a fixed fee. You can leverage the most appropriate resource at the most appropriate time. That makes a lot of sense. You know, we talked a little bit about organizations. It used to just be that it was the legal department and the law firm, but now we've got other organizations that are part of this ecosystem now. Can you just tell us a a little bit about the ecosystem as you see it now and and as you see it evolving with legal technology companies, alternative legal services providers, LPOs, the big four? I mean, where do you see us now and where do you see us going in this evolving ecosystem? So we have been presenting the ecosystem with six 
participants. It used to be in-house counsel and outside counsel. Then we added technology providers. Now we have law companies. Law schools are starting to influence the industry, regulators. And after being in Europe for the last several weeks, I think we should probably add a whole new bubble for the big four. Uh, The big four have been quiet in how they've been building their in-house operations teams. I know that uh, one of them has a pool now of 2,200 attorneys. Here's one of the other differentiators between the big four and some of the law firms is the big four are willing to invest in technology. And that the difference in the business model between law firms and the big four brings on a real threat to the ecosystem as we have known it. Yeah, well, it's certainly a lot of challenges for different folks in the ecosystem. But as we alluded to earlier, lots of opportunities as well. And I appreciate you mentioning law schools because I think challenges for law schools, but lots of opportunities here if if we embrace these challenges. Let me add one thing. These are no longer separate entities. So it is common now for everybody in the ecosystem to collaborate with another entity in the legal ecosystem. So we are not individual spokes, but we are now starting to create a unified universe. It's a sphere that we're all sitting in in the same universe versus this separate silos, which means that law firms are collaborating with law companies to provide, say, due diligence or provide legal project management or a skill set that they haven't developed and and may not make sense for them to to develop. And same thing with in-house. I've already told you that we have 20% of our law department has been outsourced to a law company. Those are resources that we, we have 18 FTEs, and then we have a pool of 50 that we can leverage as we need them. It allows us to work differently. We can scale up. We can scale down. We can pull in experts in more commodity type of work versus using expensive, even first-year associates to do some of the bread and butter work that we need, that all of us uh, have a need for. We are learning to right-size, all of us are, law firms, in-house, law companies, the schools, the regulators, all of us are learning how to leverage each other's uh, resources and talents and strengths. Well, and you've mentioned a couple of times the role of technology in all of this. Artificial intelligence is discussed a lot, and I want to talk about that. First, can you just tell us kind of the way you've integrated technology at NetApp and the way you're asking outside law firms to integrate technology as well, generally? I've been at NetApp for eight years. When I came eight years ago, we had three technologies, and these are what count as technologies. Excel, I think we had a board technology and some other minor technology. We now have 21 technologies and they are integrated. Not only are they integrated amongst each other, they are integrated into the enterprise. This is an interesting story and this is an unintended consequence. So we rolled out electronic signature four or five years ago. Electronic signature goes across the enterprise. And as a result, we had a SWAT team in legal go to different departments to help them rewrite their processes so that they would fit into a digital format. We went from the instant NDA, which was our first electronic signature implementation, to 40 use cases across the enterprise. We report the cost savings on this metric weekly to the CEO. The other unintended consequence is that when the IT department at NetApp was looking for beta testers for the chat bot and the RPA bot, they came to legal. Because we have been 
experimenting with so many technologies for so long, and we have developed a partnership with IT that is so strong, now we get to play with the new toys first. That's really exciting. And, and I love the way you're using metrics to really measure the impact of these tools. And you, know, you and I have talked a little bit about artificial intelligence. And it's interesting, there's a little bit of a you know, dichotomy in the way people look at this. Some write it off as almost all hype. Where do you think we're really going to have see the most significant impacts in the near term? And we've already seen significant impact with e-discovery, and we're seeing more and more impact with around diligence and, and contract review, things like that. Where do you think we're really going to see artificial intelligence, machine learning, natural language processing type of tools have the most significant impact on the delivery of legal services in the near term? Well, in the near term, the question is a little bit leading because the near term, the pace at which these are being rolled out and becoming valuable and useful is so much faster than any of these technologies in the past have been. So if you would have asked me this even nine months ago, I would have said, oh, man, we're five years out. No more. We are seeing significant changes and improvements in two, three, four, five, six months. So a couple of years ago, you needed an application for AI that had quite a bit of volume. That is no longer the case, and it is becoming more ingrained in our thought processes, because not only now are we thinking about it in terms of cost savings, there's an accuracy that comes with AI that is a quiet benefit. It's harder to measure. However, it is starting to impact how we structure our hires, how we structure the department, how we train our new resources. So, for example, we are training our India team on how to use our bots. They were the first people that we went to and said, we are going to train you in a new technology. It makes you more valuable. And don't be afraid. It's not going to take away your role because that's often the inhibitor to rolling out new technology. It's a fear of, oh, my goodness, if I, if I use this, I'm going to lose my job. And we're living proof that as you start to use these technologies, your job gets way more interesting and exciting and engaging. Some of these technologies are replacing processes that are incredibly tedious. Nobody loves doing them. It's like dusting all day long, <laughs> not fun. So it's bringing in a whole new way of working and it's here now. And I love that you mentioned that it's not just about efficiency, but in improving the quality, of the things that are being done, helping get better outcomes, things like that. If you were setting up a, a new legal department, what would be the, the technologies? Maybe it's two buckets, kind of like the traditional technologies you'd focus on first to make sure you're implementing. And then where would you be kind of maybe be placing bets on data-driven artificial intelligence? Well... Always when I'm starting a new department, which I have done a couple of times, I start with the money. And so we start with an e-billing technology generally. Artificial intelligence, however, has a place in contracting. It also has a place in answering routine questions. And if I were starting from scratch, I would build it into the culture. And so it would be, even if it doesn't have a clear ROI, I would put it in so that people get used to working in a different fashion and they start to innovate themselves. Once you start introducing these kinds of innovative technologies and these new ways of doing business, people get excited and they take ownership and accountability for how they're delivering legal services. In-house departments, keep in mind, in-house departments are service organizations. Our business partners are our customers. And if we can delight them and have fun, that's a win-win. All right. Well, I want to shift gears just a little bit. You mentioned law schools. And in light of all the change that we see happening, what advice would you give to students who are in law school right now? Law students must have an understanding of how the business of law is run. There is some talk about the T-shaped lawyer and the I-shaped lawyer. 
the I shaped having a very narrow, deep scope and the T shaped having a much more broad understanding of how legal services are delivered. The graduating students must have some kind of understanding about technology because very soon there will be not very many legal service providers of any kind who don't offer some kind of technology. So you have to be comfortable with technology and comfortable with data and metrics in terms of are you doing the right thing in the, at the right time for your client. In order to do that, you have to be capturing some data or somebody has to be capturing data for you and you have to be asking the right questions. So the students really do need to have an, uh, an understanding of how businesses are run. Those are their customers. Well, in that same vein, what advice would you give to law school deans about responding to these changes? The schools that integrate legal operations are providing a lifetime gift to their students. And I have had some interaction with multiple law schools, and there is hesitancy amongst the tenured staff to move in this direction. And so I would encourage the deans to push hard on this. They're graduating students at a time where they've got to have fundamental knowledge of legal technology and, uh, and some idea of how to run a business. So I'm in full support of supporting the deans, but it's a tough go in the law school. It's slow. So we've seen a little bit of an increase in hiring by legal departments of, of law school grads. Do you think if law schools are, are training students in, in the ways that we're discussing, that that trend would continue, more hiring by legal departments of students directly out of law school? That's a very good question. We just completed our internship hiring process for next summer. And one of the requirements that we are looking for on any of the resumes is how comfortable are you with technology? You're coming into a department, in-house department that has 21 technologies. Every single attorney in this department touches technology. Are you comfortable? Are our new graduates going to be comfortable with technology and will they integrate well into this kind of environment? Well, what about just the innovation community generally? Can you kind of tell our listeners whether they're law students who are being proactive and finding ways to acquire these skills even outside of their curriculum or folks in law firms, legal aid, legal departments, how do they get involved in the legal innovation community? We are getting an increased number of inquiries with exactly that question. How can I get involved? What can I do? Because CLOCK embraces the entire legal ecosystem, anybody can get involved in creating a CLOCK initiative. If you have an expertise in a particular area and you are willing to collaborate and share that with the community, it is a very easy way to become more integrated into the community, to understand a much more broad view of how the community functions and the talent set inside the community, as well as give back to the legal industry. That's great to hear. Thank you again, Connie, for joining us. I really appreciate your leadership, all that you're doing in the legal industry. For our listeners who'd like to get more involved, can you tell them how they could connect with you through CLOCK? Yes, we would be delighted to have anybody who's interested get involved in CLOCK, which includes the entire legal ecosystem. You can write to info at clockcloc.org. This has been another edition of Law Technology Now on the Legal Talk Network. If you like what you heard today, please rate us in Apple Podcasts. Join us next time for another edition of Law Technology Now. I'm Dan Linna, signing off. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via iTunes and RSS. Find us on Twitter and Facebook. Or download our free Legal Talk Network app in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.